what a powerful documentary, which is why the film won three Emmys and received the prestigious Peabody Award. And please, please see the other three acts on HBO. Well, I've, I've said this before, but it bears repeating. Into the existential climate crisis is nestled like Russian nesting dolls, all the other crises, racism, economic inequality, health, and the democracy crisis. Journalist Mary Heglar has written that today we're experiencing our great crises convergence. As she says, if you trace any one of these crises back to their roots, you'll find yourself at colonialism and slavery, all born of the same wound. When the levees broke demonstrates, demonstrates this as brilliantly as any film or documentary I've ever seen, and <laughs> shouldn't surprise us since it's a Spike Lee film, and not that he needs an introduction, but let me just say a few quick things. Besides being a director, Spike is also a producer, screenwriter, actor, and professor. His production company, 40 Acres and a Mule Filmworks, has produced more than 35 films since 1983. He made his uh, directorial debut with She's Gotta Have It, yes and has since written and directed such films as Do the Right Thing, Malcolm X, 25th Hour, Black Klansman, and Defy Bloods. Spike, I'm just thrilled that you're here to talk about your documentary with us, and I'm so grateful. Thank you. Well, Jane, I'm grateful to you for asking me to do this. Thank you. Uh, you are one of the giants. And we've seen that you've been on the right side of history, not history, the right side of history throughout the years. And so the honor is mine. Thanks. Thank you very much, Spike. I'm, I'm, I, I am a huge admirer of your films, but this is the first documentary of yours that I've seen. Have you made others? Yes, my first documentary, which I hope you see, it's called Four Little Girls. It's about the four little girls, the four little black girls who were murdered September 1963 when the sixth century Baptist church was blown apart in Birmingham, Alabama, which was uh, one of the most, say, the most uh, hor horrendous acts of domestic violence. Yeah. That was my first day. Well, I, I'll definitely see that. I went in that church, and uh, yeah. that was a powerful thing. And listen, I, know, I, I want to say it for you. You were, I know you were there. You you were in the front lines from the get go. Well, if, no. if there's a place to be, you were there, and you you weren't scared. You were fearless. As I said before, time has shown you were in the right side. You were on the right side of history. ATR and TR lock. <laughs> History. Hurster. You know, I realized that you were a feminist when I saw she's got to have it. Well, there are a lot of black women thought otherwise. <laughs> I wanted to hang me. <laughs> God, I thought it was a truly feminist film. But anyway, Spike, I'm so sorry that, you know, we, we weren't able to show all five acts of oh, when the movies broke. I mean, that's four hours, but our next documentary is eight hours. The oh. next oh. documentary is called 9-11, no, no, excuse me. My next documentary is called NYC Epicenters, 9-11 to 2020, 2021 and a half. It's about New York City during the crisis that occurred in New York City during 9-11 and today, especially when New York City was Right, it was the epicenter of Corona, and this is going to be coming on in September. I'm not trying to get a plug in, but you said when you mentioned four hours, I said, "Wait a minute, I got to mention next was eight hours." <laughs> well, I, I think that my audience is going to be very uh, inspired to go and see the rest of it on HBO because you know, 
every single act offers new insights and perspectives on on what happened following Katrina and and the levees breaking. At what moment did you know that you wanted that 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 you needed to document the crisis that started off as a category five hurricane and became something quite different. <clears throat> but you d you didn't know at the time when you started shooting everything else that was going to happen or, or did you? Uh, part of part of the, the job of a documentary filmmaker, you have to be investigated, you have to be a detective. So you're going to find stuff that you don't know about. And if you, if you interview the right people, they're going to steer you to say, you know what? I said this, but you need to talk with this person. You yeah. speak to this person. And so the story is this, Jane, I was in, of all places, I'm in Venice for the, the Venice Film really? Festival. Yes, I was there for the Venice Film Festival. And you know, it's an island. Full of water. So full of water. And, and, and I love the canals, the, the gondola. So, so my wife, Tiny Claus, says, turn on the television. Because I had heard faintly about some type of hurricane coming, but I wasn't paying too much attention to it. I turned the scene in, and for the next four or five days, I rarely left a hotel room when I didn't walk. If I, if I need to be something, I had to do something, I'd do it. But if not, I was in a hotel. And if you're in Venice, you don't want to stay in a hotel, one of the greatest cities in the world. But I cannot believe that I was seeing my fellow American citizens calling for help for the United States government. It took five days, not one, not two, not three, not four, five, for those who speak Spanish, cinco, five days for the United States of America to come to the aid, to the aid of its citizens. And it's not like it's Hawaii. It's, this is like the continent of the United States of America. I remember two or three years ago, there was a tsunami in Sri Lanka, and we were there in three days. Yeah. I also remember the, the, the Canadian Rock, the Canadian Rocky Mountain, what do they call them, guys? They got the, they got the, the Gulf Coast before the United States Army. So it was it was horrible. And coupled with weapons of mass destruction, with this, the President George Bush, see, that, that, that was not, those are two bad looks. Weapons of mass destruction and really forsaking American citizens. Right. And who knows how many lives could have been saved if the United States government had showed up. They, oh, I forget. Oh, All right, I'll give you two days. But days three, four, you got to be there. Yeah. And then FEMA, which is a joke. And it, just, it was just pure negligence, and American citizens died. And American citizens have mothers, fathers, uncles, sisters, friends who are no longer here because of that negligence. So the footage of, of, the, of the first part of it, the flooding uh, with the hurricane, that was footage that you found that other people took. Yes, that's the fire footage. So I had a weeding. I didn't go to, I didn't get to New Orleans till the week after Thanksgiving. And even then it was still like a bomb been dropped. Wow. And you mentioned before I'm a professor, uh, I'm a ten professor at NYU graduate film school. I'm gonna, put a good, I'm gonna get a plug in here, Jane. The best film school in the world, NYU, grad film school. And I took a lot of my students with me. Did you? Yes, a lot of my students were the crew. Wow. And uh, it was devastated. It was still practically shut down. But I felt I had to go there. And I wanted my students to have this experience. And even today, they come up to me and tell me how much they, they, they learned and experienced yeah. from taking that trip to a devastated uh, Gulf Coast. So how did God, I mean, having raised money for documentaries in my own life, what you just packed up and took all the students and cameras that you could find and went, or did you raise money or how, how did you finance the whole thing? Well, I have to give love to the great Sheila Nevins. Okay. Okay. Sheila yes. Ran 
she's legendary. She ran the documentary department for HBO. Right. I went straight to her and she said, Spike, go, go, get, get your cameras, get your crew, go there and shoot, shoot, shoot. And also, you say Sheila Nevins, then I know exactly what happened. Yeah, good. And that, 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 yeah. Gave me the, the funding for the first documentary, which I mentioned, of Four Little Girls. So I have a history of doing documentaries through HBO and through the great legendary Sheila Nevins. Right. So when, when you started, did you have any idea how long you'd be on the story? I think we made, you know, my memory's getting bad, but I think we made three more trips as stuff evolved. Those are the hardest interviews I had to do. Yeah. Who lost did, you, did you do any of them yourself or was it mostly I, your, your crew? Well, and your... I had to do interviews for all my documentaries. Uh-huh. And I had to like sort of a vantage because people aren't, don't really open up. Right. But they see my films, they see me in Nick Gaines, what, 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 and so they knew, who, they think they know who I am. So that that got rid of a lot of uh, barriers. That's the word. <laughs> barriers. Thank you. <laughs> and so I was very. You never would have come up with that word if I hadn't said it, right? Because <laughs> how are you going to get authentic documentaries that people interviewing don't want to open up? Well, they sure did open up. My God. Wow. I'm so glad that you, you didn't have a narrator. At, at, at I'm not a fan. No, you know, I'm, not, I'm not disrespecting anybody who uses that way. But look, sometimes if you're doing a documentary that happened like 40 years ago, they're not alive. So you got to have this. So, but the films I do, the people, here's the key word, the witnesses are still alive. So there's no need for me. Right. In my filmmaking, in my documentaries, don't need for a narrator because uh, um, people are still alive. And it's, and it's not say, now, it was not somebody to her or something. No, no. The people I interviewed were there. You know, Fire Drill Fridays has hosted a lot of our programs on environmental racism. And one of our guests, Hop Hopkins, he said, if there was no racism, there'd be no climate crisis. D- does that resonate with you? Yes, it does, because uh, it's been documented. People of color are going to live near <laughs> the oil wells and whatever is bad. Here's the thing, though. The good land, the people money going to take the good land. Right. And what's, what's left over goes to brown, black, and poor people. They're going to live near the steel mills. Yeah. Where was fucked up, that's where you're going to live because that's just the way America works. You know, you, you got if money talks and you ain't going to money. If you don't got the right money, you're going to be in the wrong neighborhood, which is going to have bad schools, which is not going to have the, the best hospitals and go down the line. So it all lines up, you know. Don't you think it's going to change? I do, but I'm well, white, but I, I, I think it's going to change. There are people like yourself, Bono, Sting, a lot of people who have a platform are talking about your people. This is the only plan we have. Now, if you're Mr. Musk and you want to live on the world, I mean, on the moon, okay. But most of us can't afford it. We could barely afford to live on this God's planet, let, let, let alone some new scientific colony in space. So, How is it that all these billionaires that want to be able to move out and live in space treat their workers so bad here? You know? Well, anyway, <laughs> as you showed so unforgettably in this documentary, the, the effects of the climate crisis is, is felt most devastatingly by frontline communities like the Lower Ninth Ward. Ooh, Lower Ninth. Right? They call them sacrifice zones. Yes. Um, and here's the thing, though. Jane, what we're talking about is not a secret. It's right. fully documented what areas are contaminated, you know? Yeah. And if your area is contaminated, there's a good chance that 
you're gonna you're gonna have some type of cancer from where you live. Flint, Michigan, the water you drink. This stuff is not an accident. This right. stuff planned out. That's right. It is planned out very deliberately. We we yes. now know it's, it's not an accident. Plan. It's not a mistake. It's not happenstance. It's not a, a flip of the coin. These things are strategically, very strategic. Strategic. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> you know what I'm just <laughs> So, um, have you been back there, and and how much has been fixed up and and changed? The well, Lower Ninth well, Ward, for example. Well, well, Jane, I did a follow up documentary to this four years four years later, called. If God is willing and the creek don't rise. God willing and the creek don't rise, yeah. Back, which is something my grandmother lived be 100 years old, you see all the time. Yeah. Back four years and dealt with this one specifically about the ecology, dealing with that, that, that BP oil spill. And it started with the Saints winning the Super Bowls. Everybody thought, you know, we got the gift of God, the lowly Saints that won the Super Bowl, and then you get the BP oil spill and like, is back the one. Have the levees, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm asking you, but I know the answer because we had a guest, uh, Colette Pichon Battle was our guest last week from the Gulf South. Uh, she's a climate activist. And she said the levees were built back the way they were before, not able to withstand a hurricane five or a slow moving storm. So we have to be sure that build back better, the Biden administration's motto, means build back better in New Orleans, build those levees back. Does and I mean? agree, but, but here's the thing though, we could really expand that to the United States and America, the world, because we're hopefully coming to the end of this pandemic and people talking about, let's go back to normal. Yeah, normal was the problem. Oh, Jane, can I just use one word for profanity here? Yeah, sure. Normal was fucked up. <laughs> so, Let's not go back to the effed up way it was. Right. And if we do that, that means that we, that we not learned any lessons this past year or whatever the length of this pandemic is. And that would be a, an affront to the people around the world who have died. Right, yes. Came back to the same old, same old. So God willing, and, and for those who don't believe in God, Pick your own word, but <laughs> things we cannot go back to the way it was. And again, that's why you prompted this thought, Jam. You saying build back better. So that's really the same thinking. Right. Have you been? Well, you have been back. How? Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, I like there now. I mean, is it as racist as it was? Has anything changed for the good? Well. I'm not going to, New York City's racist, so I'm not just going to hang it on the Gulf Coast. It's really United States and America, so I don't want to, you know, single out, right. you know, in particular, Texas, but what, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, 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 Jane, you know this better than I, racism is built in the fabric of this country. The very thread that Betty Ross, <laughs> you know, yeah. with the flag is it, the foundation of this country. So hopefully with this new administration and a re reawakening, I mean, we're talking today and this is a one day past, uh, I, I hate to use the word anniversary in a case like this, but the murder. Yeah, the murder of George Floyd. And we saw the reverberations of all, not just in the United States of America, all over the world. Right. And many, all over the world, in many of those marches, you wouldn't even see a black person in it. It was, you know, so for me, that was a great sign that yes. people want a change. People want justice for everybody. And I really, I really am encouraged by this because those marks, it was the young people. They're the ones who had to take this after the world and move forward with it. So 
if their heart and soul is in the right place, then I think that, you know, I have a, a good outlook for the future of this country, for the future of the world. Yeah. I'm glad to hear you say that, Spike. I, I, I agree with you. Here in California, you know, there are communities that are all white and they were marching carrying yeah. Black Lives Matter signs. And, you know, I think that the pandemic really exposed to a lot of people who hadn't been so aware the level of of racism and inequality and uh i think that there's good that can come out of it and i'm glad you feel that well let's let's hope so yeah and jane you were right up in the middle of i was 13 years old in 67 so i was born 57 so you were right <laughs> oh god you were right in that pocket. I mean, 67, 68, United States of America was crazy. Vietnam War, the, uh, the, the students protesting. The murders, the assassinations. Penn State, Columbia, Dr. King was assassinated. Shortly after that, uh, Bobby. Bobby, I mean, Chicago, I mean, uh, the, the Democratic Convention. Uh, the whole world's watching. Does that? Let me ask you a question. Do you see? Yes. If I may, if I may ask you a question. Yes. Do you see any similar? Sim, ooh, there's a good one. <laughs> Do you see any similarities between what's happening now and when you were right up in it during the '60s? I'm in it now, kiddo. Oh, I, oh, oh I, I'm I, I'm right I, in it right now, and I and I. Yeah, well, well, I said from the beginning, Ms. Fonda, that, that you're still in it. I'm not saying yeah. that it's stopped. You know, you know, you know what uh, hitting bottom means. Here's what I think the difference is that, you know, I said in the beginning that this has been called the great convergence of crises. What's happening right now, we've, we've hit bottom. And this wasn't true in 67 and 68. I, I think, and a lot of it has to do with the climate crisis. A lot of people realize that we are the people living right now who can determine whether there's even gonna be a future for anybody of any race and any level of wealth. Is there gonna be a future? That's why young people are so much more, you know, rising up now and, and, and awakened. Um, I, I, th I think it is different. I think that people are feeling, especially young people, we have to put our bodies on the line now or there isn't gonna be a future. You don't think they were doing that in 67? No, in I think it's different now. Right. Because, you know, I, 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 I do. I, I, this is like, this is truly existential. I don't think that we, we felt that and, and, it, and it wasn't existential in the 60s. Th this is, do we continue to live as a civilization or not, and um, and it's that's just the way it is. And we're going to have to wrap up now, Spike. Thank you very much for taking time to be with us. Right. Thank you for all your films over the years and all your work, and for your great, big, beautiful heart. And I hope you stay safe. Well, thank you. And again, I love you. You were in the trenches from the get go. I like, like, I'm going to reemphasize. This is not something new. You were doing it when need to be done. And you're part of, as I said before, I'm going to say it again. Time has proved that you were on the right side of herstory. Not history, herstory. Herstory. Yeah. God's pulling and the creek don't rise. Yeah. Thank you, Spike. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.